it all started so sweet and innocent. At 13 years old, Karen struck up a young romance with 17-year-old Leonard Tilton. He was constantly, I love you, you're beautiful, and so at 13 years old, that, you know, those are important things to hear. But Karen's mom, Betty, says early on, she felt there was something odd about her daughter's boyfriend. He just didn't seem like boyfriend material to me. Did Karen ever share any concerns with you that she may have had over his behavior? She said he was creepy. You know, she didn't want to be around him at times. And after two years together, when Karen was 15, the teen lovers broke up. What was the reason that you ended your relationship? Well, I wanted to have friends again, and any time that I would mention hanging out with a friend from school, getting a new girlfriend, he exploded. Karen says despite his controlling ways, Leonard seemed to be okay with the breakup. She soon began dating another guy, and she thought Leonard had moved on as well. Every so often he would call me though and just touch base, hey, how you doing? And you know, it was like he wanted to still remain friends. He didn't seem jealous at all. Everything seemed fine on the surface. But things were far from fine. Under that seemingly smooth surface, deep trouble was brewing. It was around that time that I started receiving hang-up calls. It was odd because he always called from a payphone. And those nuisance crank calls quickly escalated to menacing behavior. Did you ever see him out stalking you? Um, I mean, yes. There was one time that I had an early dismissal from school. Nobody knew I was getting out early. And as soon as I got in the house, I shut the door. That quick, somebody knocked on my door. So I opened the door, and it was him. And I asked him right away, you know, why are you here? Oh, I was just in the neighborhood. And he lived about 45 minutes away from my house. Karen says Leonard's behavior worried her, but not enough to call police. Then about a year after their breakup, Leonard announced he was moving across the country. He came up with this idea of um, telling me that he was moving to California. Immediately, I knew that wasn't true. He actually came over my house and he hugged my mom goodbye. And one day, her suspicions were confirmed. And how do you know he didn't go? My boyfriend at the time and I were actually on a bus, and the bus went right by his house. And there he was on a payphone. Then the creepy crank phone calls got worse. So many that Karen's mom, Betty, had to change their phone number. With no way to contact Karen, Leonard resorted to writing letters, supposedly from California. And do you remember what was in that letter? He told me he met a girl named Karen who was the same exact height as me, the same exact weight as me, about how she was now pregnant and um, he was going to be a daddy. Then another tortured letter where Leonard admits to lying about a move to the West Coast and professing his undying love for Karen. You, he had no idea what, that he was still in love with it you? It had been a year and four months at the time that we had been broken up and I had moved on. I had this new boyfriend. Life was great. I figured life was great for him. At that point, Leonard returned home from his so-called California trip and resumed his friendship with Karen. He was, for all intents and purposes, your first real boyfriend. We were together for almost two years and from the time of being 13 to 15, that's a huge part in my life and um, I shared it with him. So with her guard down, Karen invited Leonard to hang out with her and her new boyfriend on a night when nearly everyone in the nation was glued to their TV sets. The week of June 12th, um, when your brother and Nicole were murdered, that's all that was on TV. And um, he was over my house a few times that week and he um, I remember him turning to my mother and saying do you think he did it meaning OJ and my mom everything was so new it was it just happened it just came out and I didn't even know who OJ Simpson was I had no clue I could have cared less I didn't me neither yeah. yeah and we watched the whole chase from beginning to end and as soon as the car chase was over he, he left immediately right afterwards Karen recalled that after a few days passed, she gets a strange call from Leonard telling her he dyed his hair black and she just had to see it. So he took the bus down to my house to show me his dyed black hair. And I couldn't believe it. And I just thought it was the craziest thing. I, I, he, he looked evil. And as I walked him to the door, he just looked at me straight faced and said, I could kill you because nobody knows that I'm here. And I shut the door, I locked the door, 
my gut instinct took over. I knew he was going to kill me. It was a bone chilling feeling that Karen tried desperately to shake. I said to myself, you're being stupid. No, he's not. I knew better, but I chose to ignore it. That would be a near fatal mistake. Just a few days later, on an early morning in June, Karen hears Leonard throwing rocks at her window. He motions to let him in. I was just more or less talking to him from the door, and he basically walked in. I said, you're not supposed to be here. He, he was just like, yeah, you know, just give me a few minutes. I'll, I'll leave, you know, whatever. But when he didn't leave, Karen became flustered and called her grandmother, who lived a few doors down. I just kept fighting with him to leave and um, he wouldn't. So I went back upstairs and I shut my bedroom door and I laid back down in bed. My grandma, she came down the house and she actually searched the entire house and couldn't find anybody. In her bedroom, Karen dozed off only to wake up to a strange sensation. He was at the foot of my bed and he had his hands underneath the sheets and he was caressing my feet. I jumped up out of bed and I screamed. Karen says she ran downstairs with Leonard on her heels. She tried to remain calm, asking him again to leave. I looked at him and I said, are you ready to go? And he said, yes. Can I strangle you? As he was putting his hands around my neck. And then what? And then he lifted me up off of the ground and held me in the air over his head by my neck. Karen passed out. When she regained consciousness, she noticed Leonard had removed her clothes and put her in a dress. But now her chest was covered in blood. When I looked over at him, he was kneeling on the floor beside me, and he raised a 14-inch serrated butcher knife over his head and jammed it into my chest. It was like he was prying my ribs open, and he was hissing and making awful grunting sounds. I remember thinking, I'm never going to see the sun again. My mom was at work, and I just wanted to see my mom before I died. <laughs> and then um, he took the knife, and he wrapped it in a towel, and he threw it underneath of the bed. And then he got down on the floor next to me, and he kissed me on my lips and told me that he loved me. He um, shoved me underneath of my sister's old bed and um, covered me up with sheets. And then he left the room. Karen was literally left for dead. But what happens next is almost unbelievable. As I laid there with my hand on my chest, feeling myself die, I knew I had to get out. 16-year-old Karen Wittes is brutally attacked. He pulled the knife out and blood went everywhere. Karen's ex-boyfriend, Leonard Tilton, beat, stabbed, and strangled her, wrapped her body in a sheet, stuffed her under the bed, and left her for dead. But against all odds, Karen managed to survive. Wriggle your, I mean, I, I so yeah, I kind of just, um, with my, with my um, right hand over my chest, I kind of squeezed my way out from underneath of the bed, and then I staggered into my bedroom. And I called 911. And what did you say? Well, the dispatcher answered, and I said, um, I'm being murdered. As Leonard was leaving, he overheard Karen's desperate cry for help. He ran back to finish her off. And he grabbed me by my face, and he knocked me off my feet and onto the floor. And then he told me, just die, Karen. Let yourself go. Let yourself die. Karen was dying. But despite deep wounds within an inch of her heart, miraculously, she survived. Until her attacker left, this time for good. I just kept saying to myself, he's not going to kill me. He's not going to win. Somehow, Karen managed to drag her bloody and half-naked body out of her house and over to her grandparents' home a few doors away. And what happened when you got to grandma's um, I walked up. I walked up their steps and into their house, and my grandfather and grandmother jumped up. And um, my grandfather grabbed me, and he, I collapsed in his arms. Police officer Jim Goodchild lived across the street. He jumped into duty when he saw the horror unfolding just feet from his home. 
you see your neighbor walking down the street, what, what goes through your mind? The main thing was to find out if he was still in the area. She was able to give me a good description while I was on the phone with police. Bleeding severely and hovering on the edge of death, Karen was able to tell cops they could find Leonard at a nearby bridge where he told her he was going to kill himself. He was, in fact, on the Tacony Palma Palmyra Bridge about to jump. And they said that um, when they arrested him, he had a photo in his hand. I actually kind of asked, can I see who it is? Because they didn't know who it was. And I said, that's me. I was beaten so badly that they couldn't rec recognize me from my photo. Cops grab Leonard before he jumps. Meanwhile, Karen, fighting for life, but still conscious, is rushed to the hospital. They made an incision and they inserted a chest tube because I had a collapsed lung. At that point, they didn't know if my heart had been stabbed. Doctors had little hope she would make it through the night. Once they had me stabilized, they allowed my family to come in to basically say goodbye to me. The police were just basically waiting around the hospital, waiting for the time of death. But unbelievably, Karen lived, only to learn something horrific. Leonard had also raped her. What does that do to your psyche? It changed everything. Everybody knew that I was raped but me. I was literally the last person to know. And I remember the first words out of my mouth was, does my mom know? Does my grandparents know? And yeah, they did. District Attorney Deborah Nash will never forget the moment the case came across her desk. So it was such a vicious assault, and I have actually prosecuted and seen homicide cases where the injuries were much less than what Karen sustained. But Tilton was not charged with attempted murder. Instead, he faced charges of rape, aggravated assault, and possession of a weapon. Even at the preliminary hearing, he continued his reign of terror. I gave my testimony of what happened that day, all while my attacker was staring at me from across the courtroom, wearing the same exact boots and shorts and everything that he had on that day. And as soon as I was done giving my testimony and stating what he had done to me, he mouthed the words, I love you to me. Oh my God. And I told the judge and the judge told me to just ignore it. After the hearing, Tilton's bail is set. The district attorney, the, the DA, he wanted to raise his bail and they said, oh, well, he can't afford it anyway, so we'll just keep it at that. And he actually was able to make bail, and he got out on bail. Shockingly, Karen was never notified that Tilton was out of jail and only found out when she went to her mailbox. Did he contact you? Yes. As soon as he was released, he wrote me a letter. And he went on to tell me that I was the only girl that he ever loved. And he's sorry. And um, how could he do this to me? When the letter came, my mom, we opened it together and we both frantically read the disgusting words that this maniac, uh, it's like, it, it's almost like he, he thinks he's above the law. Tilton did indeed appear to think he was above the law. He skipped his bail hearing, and after he was arrested, eventually pleaded guilty to felony charges, including aggravated assault and rape. Did that surprise you that it was aggravated assault? Yes, very much, because it was clearly murder. I mean, he was telling me to die. He stabbed me multiple times. He strangled me multiple times. He beat me in the face until I was unconscious over and over again. Um, telling me to die, that's murder. I felt like the system was failing me already. Tilton was this time back in the slammer for a while. But even a cement cell couldn't stop him from terrorizing Karen. He called you from prison. Mm -hmm. It was my birthday. I answered the phone and all I heard was, don't hang up. And as soon as I heard that voice, I, um, I fell to my knees and I just began screaming. And I told him, shut up. He then proceeded to tell me that Prison wasn't at all what he expected. Instead, it was more like a rest home. Tilton's plea deal got him sentenced to 15 to 40 years in prison, which means after serving 15 years, he's eligible for parole. And under current law, that's not once every five or 10 years, that happens every year. So Karen is forced to relive her nightmare each time she fights to keep him locked up. So Leonard Tilton continues to come up for parole. 
-hmm. How do you find the strength and the courage to keep facing him? It's just something I have to do. Um, whether if I want to or not, I have to. I want him dead. I want him dead more than anything in the world. Now, Karen is fighting to get legislation passed called Karen's Law, which will prevent violent sexual predators from being able to apply for parole. For my own safety and for, for you know, everything that I've been through, but for everybody, you know, for any victim that's going through anything even remotely close to what I'm going through. And Karen's mom, Betty, is convinced that if Tilton ever walks the streets again, he will come back for her daughter and finish the job. I'm very afraid because I feel that he will find her who want to finish what he started. And I'll do everything in my power to stop him. If Leonard Tilton is granted his freedom, are you afraid for your safety? Yes. I may not be sure of a lot of things, but that gut instinct that I used to feel, with that I feel stronger than ever. He spent an hour trying to murder me. It's not over for him. While Tilton has been in prison, he's continued to write Karen letters, professing his love and saying he's going to commit suicide. He also included drawings of skulls. And until she can help pass a law to prevent it, Karen vows she'll be at every parole hearing to make sure Tilton stays where he belongs, locked up 